Good afternoon and welcome to the latest installment in the Baker Bots corporate series. Today we're going to be talking about the MLP drop down process after the um, El Paso case, which was, came out earlier this year. Many of you have uh, read about it or, or heard about it, and we have, we have some things to say. I'm Josh Davidson. I head the Capital Markets and MLP practice group at Baker Botts. I've worked uh, with MLPs for over 20 years and I've done a lot of work representing conflicts committees and sponsors doing drop downs and financial advisors representing conflicts committees. Also on the panel with me is David Sterling, who chairs the uh, firm wide litigation department at Baker Botts. He has a lot of experience with uh, derivative and uh, other types of shareholder lawsuits in Delaware, as well as security uh, class actions. And also on the panel is A.J. Erickson, one of my corporate partners who works with me extensively in the MLP area. Our agenda <coughs> consists of uh, four main topics. One, A.J. will start with a description of, the, uh, of a typical MLP drop-down process and explain how that uh, poses conflicts of interest between the sponsor doing the drop down and the MLP. And then he'll talk about the uh, framework for resolving conflicts of interest both under the Delaware uh, partnership statute and the partnership agreement. All partnership agreements are uh, a little bit different, but uh, they share uh, very <clears throat> significant similarities in handling conflicts of interest. Then David will talk about the case itself and the decision handed down in April. Um, also, there was another decision in the case handed down this morning about standing. Uh, it's a very long decision, but David will talk about that as well. And then I will follow up with some takeaways for complex committees, but also for sponsors on um, best practices they can follow to, uh, <clears throat> to stay out of trouble. A few housekeeping issues, uh, housekeeping matters. If you have questions during the program or after the program, you can send an email to Andrew Scott with our firm. Uh, Andrew's email address is andrew.scott at bakerbots.com, A-N-D-R-E-W dot S-C-O-T-T -T at bakerbots.com. This program has been approved for CLE credit in Texas and California, it's one hour of participatory credit. And in New York, it's one hour of professional practice, transitional and non-transitional credit. We will provide the number for your affirmation form uh, later in the program. Also, a recording of this webinar will be circulated within 24 hours, and the slides will be posted to our firm website at www. Bakerbots.com. And with that, I'll turn it over to AJ. Great, thanks, Josh. Um, so we'll begin by talking about the drop down process, just, just basic nuts and bolts. But the key, of course, to MLPs is growing your distribution over time. And the key to selling an MLP in a normal market, um, I don't know if anybody can sell an MLP uh, right now, but the, the key to selling that. Telling that in the IPO is the growth story, and, and the easiest growth story to tell is, is to say, look at our great sponsor. We're starting out with a handful of assets, but all of this other stuff is over here to be sold to the MLP over time, and in so doing, grow the distributions on a per unit basis. Um, when, those drop, when those assets get dropped down and which assets, that's a decision that the sponsor is going to make. And when, when they decide to do that, it begins with a proposal from the sponsor to the board of, of the MLP's general partner. That, asks, or that, that, that proposal will have various elements, but typically you'll see you know, what is it that we're offering? What's the reason that we're offering this asset to the MLP right now? What, what's our, our view as a sponsor on, on the price? And, and potentially the form of consideration if the price is other than all cash. Um, 
the sponsor will have some views on the best way for the MLP to finance that transaction. Um, they'll provide some projections to the sponsor on what the cash flow stream looks like and the other financial performance going out. And part of that, depending on the asset and the sponsor, there might be some other agreements that are proposed in connection with the drop down. For example, if you're an ENP company putting in gathering assets, um, part of what makes that acquisition work is, is you're going to agree to be a big customer for those assets and provide some commitments uh, for an extended period of time. The board then that receives this proposal uh, almost invariably is going to take it and turn it over to the conflicts com committee to handle for reasons that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, the committee is empowered to uh, hire its own advisors um, at the, on the partnership's dime. That'll include typically a financial advisor who will speak to the fairness of the consideration, as well as legal advisors to, to advise the board on their duties and to negotiate the contracts with the sponsor. Uh, management, the management team at the sponsor, perhaps the MLP, they're probably the same people in many instances. We'll make a presentation to the committee and the advisors about the assets, about the transaction terms, really about the industrial logic of what's being proposed. And then those advisors on behalf of the committee and then the committee as well through their own questions will perform, perform whatever diligence they think is required to ultimately make their determination that the transaction is in the best interest of the partnership agreement. Uh, for all of the agreements that are involved, the sponsor is going to take the first cut at all of that and propose that either as part of the initial proposal or after floating the idea and getting uh, getting an indication back from the MLP that this might be something they're interested in. They'll propose all those forms and the lawyers really get to work. Um, so what are the things that the committee is looking for when it makes its evaluation of the transaction. One of the things we'll talk about some more is, is a key threshold question is the committee has to understand and be comfortable with the business rationale. Uh, there are lots of assets out there that the MLP could buy and there's, there's nothing that says the sponsor is the only shop in town. Um, so it, it's thinking about the asset that being proposed in the context of the MLP's overall portfolio and whether this is something that makes us makes us better off as opposed to something that we could find from an unrelated party that also is going to grow our distributions. Uh, the financial advisor is going to have a preliminary view on the price being proposed and whether we're in the right neighborhood to start from or, 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 or miles apart, um, and then lawyers will always have thoughts. Um, if the committee wants to move forward because kind of those threshold, those threshold questions are met, then, then you really get into full negotiation, which culminates with, with approval. Uh, at, at the approval stage, the committee typically hasn't been delegated full authority to sign off on the transaction, what they're really what the sponsor is, or excuse me, what the general partner board is really looking for from the committee is a recommendation that will be a special approval under the partnership agreement. They'll take that recommendation, approve the transaction. Approvals also happen at the sponsor agreement, sponsor level, and then you're, you're signing and announcing it. Hopefully the market is responding favorably to, to the deal that you've cut. Well, you can, you can see in all of this, there's, there's a huge conflict of interest. Um, the sponsor owns the general partner. Really, there's nothing that the MLP could do if the sponsor says, no way, we don't want you to do that since you've got the power to put, put whoever you want on the board. It's the most controlling shareholder that you can have. Well, for, for Delaware, uh, in a partnership setting, if you don't say anything or don't set some contractual standards, the duties that you have as a director or as a general partner are really the same as the, that you'd have in a corporation. 
duty of care, duty of loyalty, duty of good faith. Well, just like in a, in a corporation, when, when you're dealing with a controlling shareholder, you've got a related party transaction, that's something that the courts are really going to take a, uh, take a close look at. For corporations, you get the courts are, are more deferential to the, the decision made by the board if, if it's gone through a, a special committee. And that's a committee of directors who are disinterested. Well, for partnerships, the world is even better. And really what makes the whole drop-down system work is that the partnership statute, unlike the corporate statute, says, yeah, these are de defaults, but you don't have to follow them if you'd like by contract partners through the partnership agreement can eliminate all of the default fiduciary duties under Delaware law and, and create some contractual standards. And so that's what people like Josh and and other uh, other gray haired or, or no haired folks have, have done over the careful <laughs> careful <laughs> is create a form that really works well works well for this and imports fiduciary like concepts into the partnership without but without being as, as rigid. So you, you, you really rewrite all of the rules that govern it. The one thing you can't eliminate is the implied contract or the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. But really what that is is to say if if, if there's a gap, if there's something that you haven't spoken to in the in the partnership agreement, of course you're gonna write into that what makes sense. But over the years smart people have as best as we know, closed all those gaps. Uh, whenever a, a new case comes out, uh, you address that gap too. So, what does the partnership agreement say about about resolving these contract conflicts of interest? The partnership agreement says that a general partner, when it's acting as the general partner of the partnership, simply needs to act in good faith, and there's not any other standard and then goes on to define what, in this context, good faith means. Uh, there are slight variations among partnership agreements about how you define it, but, but the basic definition is a subjective belief that, that the action is either in or in, not opposed or not adverse to the best interests of the partnership. Um, you know, that, that's a terrific standard. Um, it, it's, it's subjective, not objective, in, in, in all but the oldest of partnership agreements. And what makes what makes El Paso so unusual is that the court said, even though they said they have a subjective belief, the court says, no, we, we don't really think you did. That's so kind of kind of a strange decision. Um, but an action that's taken in good faith is defined in the partnership agreement is binding on all the partners, and then the partnership agreement also pro creates a presumption that the general partner and its directors act in good faith. So that really puts the burden on the plaintiffs to show that the directors didn't subjectively believe what they were doing was in or not adverse to the partnership. So you can see why that's such a difficult, uh, why that's so difficult for plaintiffs to do. There are some other ways under the partnership agreement that you can resolve a conflict of interest. Um, but in the drop-down context, almost without exception, it's going to be this conflict committee approval process. You could put it to a vote of your, your unit holders and see if the, the common unit holders, other, other than the general partners and affiliates, uh, approve a transaction, but that's a that's a pretty drastic step to take when you've got such a, a nice built-in mechanism. And, and there are other standards that where the board could determine that this is uh, as good as a third-party deal or, or fair and reasonable, taking into account all of, all of the other circumstances, including other transactions. Maybe this one's not great, not as great, but some, there are some really good deals with the, the sponsor. But uh, again, because You've got such a clear path with the conflicts committee mechanism. That's 
that's the path folks go down. And I would add that I think the market expects there to be conflicts committee approval in those types of transactions. Absolutely. Um, so, so who can be on a who can be on a conflicts committee? Well, uh, like the special committee in Delaware, you know, the thought is you, you have people who are who are disinterested in the transaction. They have no reason to look out for the interests of, of anyone other than the, the partnership and, and the common unit holders, although the, the duty is just to the partnership. Um, typically, you're required, and, and as a practical matter, you want to have more anyway, but to have at least two members on that committee, since you've got three independents for your audit committee, those are usually the same people who are on the conflicts committee. And then, in addition to meeting the standards for serving on an audit committee under the SEC and NYSE rules, You've got a couple of other uh, no's built into the partnership agreement. You can't be an employee or an officer of the general partner. You can't be an officer, director, or employee of, of, of the affiliates, meaning really the sponsor. And, and you shouldn't have an equity stake in the sponsor or its affiliates. Sometimes that's not an, abs an absolute standard, but as a, as a practical matter there, too, it's a best practice that the only equity that you have in, in the MLP or its affiliates is just common units or any LTIP awards that you might have in, in the partnership. So when a court is looking to see whether a director is independent for purposes of serving on the conflicts committee, the court should just look at this definition. In practice, courts will consider other types of relationships, which um, AJ will talk about, uh, that uh, aren't technically a problem under the partnership agreement, but might make the court think that uh, the independence is nonetheless compromised and therefore uh, harder for that director to make a finding of uh, <clears throat> a subjective a finding that that person had a subjective belief that the transaction was in the best interest of the partnership. Yeah. It's kind of thinking about what are the relationships that are problematic. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about Spaceballs, the Mel Brooks movie, and, and there's this scene in there. As we all do. Right. It, but there's a great scene in there where, where Dark Helmet and Lone Star, you know, Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker figures are about to have their lightsaber battle and says, you know, before, you know, before I kill you, you need to know something. I was your father's brother's nephew's cousin's former roommate. And, and he, he says, well, what does that make us? Absolutely nothing. So there are clearly relationships that you could have that are so ridiculous that they, they don't matter. But somewhere between, between Mel Brooks and what the partnership agreement and the stock exchange requires, there's a level of inquiry that you should have. And, and that, that gets fleshed out some in, in, in the cases. Um, you know, there, there, and these are these these cases are, are more in the corporate context, but kind of in, in advising a, a committee, uh, council will, will will still, notwithstanding the partnership agreement standards, encourage the committee to think a, a lot like a corporate director and, and, and apply those duties because that's the way the court's going to think about it. But so some some relationships that have been problems in other contexts that wouldn't the per se bars on independence have been things like you know, the, the sponsor or the, the corporation is making big donations to a charity that, that's really near and dear or somehow associated with that director. Or you know, the NYSC might say, you only look at immediate family members, but it, you know, if there's a, a really, really close relationship with my grandpa, that might still affect the way the way I think about things. Um, there have been cases where a, a director has no no personal financial benefit, for example, in in political donations. But courts have said, yeah, a lot of donations were funneled with this guy through this director, and that elevated his status. So he still has some, some reason to feel beholden to the people making those donations, and so. Forth. So forth. And another thing to think about is, is, is what your look back period is. For, for the New York Stock Exchange independent rules, you might just look 
three years for most things. But one of the things the court notes in El Paso is, yeah, these guys are independent, um, but they spent almost their entire career working for the sponsors. They might they might have different feelings about the sponsors than, than a, a true independent. There's there's a little bit of a tension in that a company looking for independent directors may say, especially smaller companies, um, well, who you know, who do we want as an independent director? Who do we know? So they start with who do they know, and therefore they already have some pre-existing relationships with that person. But they're looking there because they, they, they know the person, they have confidence in that person's abilities. It may not be that they are looking for favoritism. It's just sort of a natural inclination to go to whom you know. Uh, there is a large pool of people still willing to serve as independent directors and, of course, going to say, why did you go to somebody with which you had such a close relationship when there are all these other people you could have you could have chosen? And so <clears throat> we, we um, wrestle with this all the time, but we advise companies to really think carefully before appointing somebody with whom they've had some sort of significant relationship, even if it doesn't technically pose an independence. Yeah, so with that, with that backdrop on what the process is and also you already see some of the potential pitfalls, David will walk us through the case. Uh, before I talk about the El Paso opinion, let me kind of put this into context. The El Paso opinion came down in April of this year and it was kind of a blockbuster. Not because it purported to create or rewrite Delaware law, but just because from a factual standpoint and from a result standpoint, it was highly, highly unusual. I think history is going to say that the April opinion, which will become known as El Paso 1, is going to get dwarfed by what came out this morning, which will be known as El Paso 2. Because what happened in El Paso 2, to make a long story short, shortly after the trial of El Paso 1, Kinder Morgan consummated its roll-up of all of its affiliated entities, including the El Paso MLP. Under traditional standing doctrines and under traditional notions of derivative law, once the shareholder no longer owns the security, he or she can no longer uh, prosecute a derivative action. And that doctrine holds true even up until the time that you collect the judgment. So under traditional notions of Delaware and derivative law, the shareholder, Brinkerhoff, lost standing four days after the trial closed when Kinder Morgan consummated the roll-up and El Paso MLP ceased to exist. That issue was raised before the El Paso 1 trial. Vice Chancellor Laster decided to not decide it because it, it involved, as he recognized, some very, very thorny issues of Delaware law, and he figured if the defendants win the case, the trial, then I don't have to deal with all this. The defense lost the case, therefore he had to deal with a standing question. His opinion just came out this morning. It is 110 pages of Travis Laster attempting to harmonize and synthesize disparate elements of Delaware law on standing, uh, the nature of derivative suits versus direct claims. When can a shareholder prosecute what ostensibly was a derivative claim post losing his or her security interest by a merger and so forth, and there's going to be a lot written about this. So I think history is going to say El Paso II, which really does try to create new law, is going to be the more significant legal opinion, but El Paso I is the more interesting one from a factual perspective. So what happened in El Paso I? El Paso I involved in effect, two drop-downs. There was a spring drop-down that the court talked about at some length in which the parents sold El Paso MLP a 51% interest in Southern LNG Elba, which owned an LNG terminal and a 190-mile natural gas pipeline connecting the terminal to an interstate pipeline for $963 million. Now, it's, it's significant that the market reaction to the spring drop-down was not positive. While the MLP index the day of the announcement of the drop down was down slightly, uh, the El Paso MLP dropped by 3.6%, and the conflicts committee noted that. Then you get to a fall drop down a few months later in which the parent sold the El Paso MLP the remaining 49% interest that it sold the 51% interested in the spring uh, 
along with uh, another asset, a 15% interest in Southern Natural Gas, which operated a natural gas pipeline, for a unitary price of about $1.4 billion. Again, these are two disparate assets combined, one unitary price. According to the plaintiff's expert, a minimum of $931 million of that $1.4 billion should be allocated or had to be allocated to the Southern LNG Elba asset. Also important to note that this the fall drop-down was the fifth drop-down transaction since the MLP's IPO, and it was the third drop-down in just 2010. And notably, in each of the drop-down transactions, an ad hoc complex committee was formed to negotiate the transaction. The committee engaged independent legal and financial advisors, highly, highly respected, and in each time obtained a fairness opinion that the, that the drop-down was fair from a financial perspective to the unaffiliated unit holders. And the committee obtained the approval uh, via the, I'm sorry, the committee approved the drop-down via the special approval process in the MLP agreement. So back to what AJ said before, the MLP agreement had just a good faith standard which made it conclusive and binding upon everybody uh, so long as two of the three conflicts committee members had a good faith belief, good faith subjective belief that this drop down was in the best interest of the MLP. And here you had three guys, all very respected business people, who said, yep, I believe this was in the best interest of the MLP. They were advised by a very good counsel, advised by an outstanding financial advisor. And yet, after a three-day trial, the court said, nah, uh, I believe that the committee, and this is a quote, failed to form a subjective belief that the fall drop-down was in the best interest of the El Paso MLP. On that basis, the court determined that the general partner violated the partnership agreement by causing the MLP to engage in the fall drop-down. So again, what makes this so significant is this is the only case we or anybody in Delaware know of in which the court imposed liability in a situation like this. The court did not impose liability on any person or entity other than the general partner because the court viewed this as a breach of the limited partnership agreement and the individual uh, defendants, the conflict committee members, were not parties to that agreement. The court accepted the plaintiff's expert's testimony that El Paso MLP paid $171 million more for the LNG asset than it should have and it entered judgment for that amount. So why did the court rule against the committee? The court was certainly highly critical of the committee, its financial advisor, and the process by which the fall drop-down was approved. The court said that none of the problems that identified that I'll talk about in a minute, or even a combination of the problems, would have overcome the presumption of good faith that AJ talked about as long as the committee members reached a rational decision for comprehensible reasons but in the court's view, quote, the number of problems reached a tipping point, unquote. The court recognized that the committee met the independent standards, but it took a, a couple pot shots at the committee members because two of the three had significant past employment ties to the parent and significant ownership stakes in the parent stock. But the court really didn't hang its hat on independence at all. Um, in addition, the court criticized the rigor of the financial advisor's valuation analysis and changes that it made in, the fall, in its analysis of the fall drop-down vis-a-vis the spring drop-down. But again, the court's decision really hung on the conduct of the committee members, not the FA. The court essentially, throughout the opinion, cited six reasons for finding that the committee did not have a subjective belief that the transaction was in the best interest of the MLP. First one, the court believed that the committee lost sight of its responsibilities. Fundamentally, the court believed that the committee took its eye off the ball. Both from the opinion, they thought the fall drop-down would allow El Paso MLP to increase distributions in its common units while achieving parents' goal of raising inexpensive capital. 
neither factor meant the transaction was in the best interest of the MLP, unquote. The court determined that the committee disregarded their known duty to determine that the fall drop down was in the best interest of the MLP. Second reason, the court believed that the committee essentially, and this is another quote from the opinion, just went through the motions. The court repeatedly talked about what it called the pattern of practice and drop downs between the parent, the committee, and the advisors. This was the fifth drop down. The committee noted that this was not, um, the court, the court noted that this was not a standing committee, it was an ad hoc committee comprised every time all five drop downs of the exact same members, all five times the, the uh, conflict committee hired the same law firm, the same financial advisor. Each time uh, one particular member of the committee served as the negotiating person uh, against the parent. Each time he obtained some slight price improvement from the parent's offer, and then special approval was consummated. Based upon that pattern, the court had a sense that the parties were really just going through the motions. Uh, the court was troubled by the lack of pushback by the committee, especially when its members had significant reservations about valuation, to some extent driven by the concern that the price paid in the spring drop down had been too high. Uh, following the Poor market reaction to the spring drop down, one committee member emailed the other members saying, quote, the next time we have to negotiate harder, unquote. Also, the parents' proposed price for the fall drop down wound up being higher on a percentage basis than the spring drop down, even though the interest acquired in the fall drop down was a minority interest. <clears throat> the court also felt that the committee did not take the time to fully understand and question the financial advisor's analysis, the purchase price, or the extent of key contractual guarantees. Reason number three. The court found that the committee was, this is another quote, preoccupied with accretion. And as AJ noted, accretion really is kind of a fundamental issue and rationale behind a drop down. But the court noted that just because a drop down is accretive, that says nothing as to whether the drop down transaction is either in the best interest of the MLP or that the price is fair to the MLP. The court recognized that any drop down can be found to be accretive based upon how it is financed. So accretion, while it is kind of a gating issue for a drop-down transaction, really is a separate inquiry from valuation. The court held that, quote, rather than concluding that the fall drop-down was in the best interest of El Paso MLP, the committee members determined that the fall drop-down was accretive. For purposes of special approval, that was all the committee thought was required, unquote. And again, accretion in distributable cash flow is a, it's certainly an important concept in MLP drop-downs, but as the court found, quote, accretion is not part of valuation, unquote. And, quote, accretion analysis says nothing about whether the buying is, buyer is paying a fair price, unquote. Bottom line is the court said the court, I'm sorry, the committee should have paid far more attention to traditional valuation techniques such as EBITDA multiples paid in comparable transactions. A fourth reason for finding against the committee. Emails between the committee members after the spring drop down reflected strong reservations about the MLP increasing its exposure to LNG at the time. Despite those concerns and the determination that in the LNG market after the spring and the deterioration in the LNG market after the spring drop down, the committee did not push back really at all when the, prepare, when the parent proposed another sale of LNG assets to the MLP in the fall drop down. In effect, the court viewed based upon contemporaneous documents, especially emails between the committee members, that the committee really didn't believe in the industrial logic behind the fall drop down. And in the court's mind, if you don't believe in the industrial logic behind the transaction, how can you really believe in good faith that this drop down, this transaction is in the best interest of the MLP. Another uh, fact point was while selling LNG assets to the MLP, 
parents' management at the same time was declining other opportunities to invest in LNG pro projects for the parent. Rather than exercising its right of first refusal, it allowed the sale to a third party of 30% of another LNG project in which parent held a 50% interest. At the time, parent CEO described the transaction as, quote, not a pretty picture. A fifth reason, the committee never really appreciated that the MLP paid the same amount per the court's analysis of the drop-down price for the LNG assets in the fall as it had in the spring. And again, in the spring, the, the market for LNG was stronger than it was in the fall. Nor in the court's mind did the committee give appropriate consideration to the control premium. As the court found, it was the parent that insisted on treating these two disparate assets in the fall drop down as a unitary transaction. The court also found that the committee members understood that aggregating the purchase price helped parent and that the aggregation was done for cosmetic reasons. But the way it worked in the fall drop down was the parent proposed the unitary price. The committee negotiated, again, a slight price improvement but when the two assets were then aggregated, the committee was unaware of the fact that when the, when the two assets got aggregated, the purchase price for the LNG assets went back up to the equivalent of the spring price. And as the court noted, it wasn't clear to the court that the committee members appreciated that until trial. Finally, and notably, the court was unimpressed with the testimony of the committee members and the record of their negotiations. Quote from the opinion, in most instances, the committee members and the financial advisor had no explanation for what they did. They had, quote, few specific recollections, unquote, and they often resorted to, quote, what they typically did, unquote, in drop downs. And again, the contemporaneous documents reflected that the committee members had concerns about the logic behind the drop down and their lack of understanding about the price. And in contrast to that, there were really no documents, contemporaneous documents, that truly reflected that at the time that they approved or negotiated the fall drop down, the committee members subjectively believed that this transaction was in the best interest of the MLP. And with that, I'll hand it over to Josh. Thank you, David. At this time, I will uh, give you the number to put on the affirmation form to earn appropriate number of CLE credits. I'll say it twice. The number is 58516. 58516. So the El Paso decision had an unusual result. How unusual, how, how different were the procedures followed in that uh, drop-down scenario from a typical drop-down that, that other people work on? And that's a very good question. We have the court's record on that, the court's finding. But we you know, we know that the committee was advised by very reputable financial advisors and legal counsel who presumably gave similar advice and similar presentations to those they do in other drop downs. We have uh, directors who had, had, a, had good reputation and worked hard and, 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 um, and deliberated and came up with their decision. There are emails that <clears throat> led the court to believe maybe they weren't so convinced of their uh, of belief as they said they were, were, and there were some other things that the court latched on to. So when I go through best practices, these best practices uh, were best practices that I would have told the committee to do before this. I'll elaborate a little bit on it in light of the decision. And then after these best practices, I'll talk about takeaways specifically from the case and, and where some emphasis should be. AJ talked about uh, conduct of the Conflicts Committee a little bit earlier when he said that directors on a Conflicts Committee should act like corporate directors and follow similar procedures. The partnership agreement doesn't try to spell out the procedures that a Conflicts Committee should follow. Theoretically, it could do that, but it's simply too hard to try to deal with um, every situation 
in the partnership agreement, and so we have uh, more uh, principles to be followed. So the first best practice relates to authorization. The board of the general partner needs to authorize the conflicts committee to evaluate and negotiate the transaction. That word negotiate uh, years ago was, was somewhat controversial whether the committee should actually have that authority, but, um, but evaluate, negotiate, and then recommend to the full board. Theoretically, the full board could completely delegate the matter to the conflicts committee and the conflicts committee decision would be final, uh, but that is unusual. Most boards like to retain the final authority, again, theoretically, to have the ability to approve a drop down even if the conflicts committee voted no. I'm not aware of any situation in which anybody has done that, but um, there remains a possibility. These resolutions have become fairly standard. They give a fairly broad grant of authority to the committees. They certainly authorize the committees to hire their own independent counsel and financial advisors at the company's expense. But when you, when you follow technical, um, when you have to follow provisions of the partnership agreement, you want uh, this to be well documented on what authority the committee actually has. Full information, due diligence, uh, again, this is reasonably common sense that a committee should be well informed about the transaction that has been put in front of it. Typically, the management will give a presentation to the financial advisors, to the directors, and to the lawyers. And I always recommend that the directors attend that presentation in person if they can and ask questions, which uh, most of the time is what happens. At that presentation, management, it, it, it's, it's like any other investor presentation that management would give, uh, and they will talk about the rationale for the transaction, both from the sponsor's point of view and from the, uh, the MLP's point of view, and go and do a reasonably deep dive into the assets and the uh, projected cash flows from the various assets. They talk about liabilities and uh, synergies and so forth. Lawyers uh, for the committee will do due diligence, typical acquisition diligence, and report back to the committee on any material issues they find. And of course, the financial advisor's presentation is diligence from the committee's perspective. And so, uh, it's important that directors spend some time studying those presentations. Often they show up a little bit late or just before a meeting, so it may be hard to study in advance. Uh, if, that, if that happens, the directors should certainly take the time during the meeting or after the meeting to really get uh, uh, thoroughly comfortable with the presentation. And what's, what's a little different in a, a, a drop-down situation than a third party transaction is that the sponsor is essentially obligated to provide its projections to the, um, the committee. So the committee has a little bit more information than it would if it were negotiating from a third party. Third and very important are that the advisors have to be independent and that the committee must be able to select Law, a law firm and a financial advisor of its own choosing. I get a lot of questions from companies. Well, can we tell the committee who to use or can we recommend who they use and so forth? And what I say is you certainly have to tell them if any of these uh, law firms or financial advisors have a conflict of interest. And if your directors aren't familiar with MLPs, you can give them names of uh, advisors who do have expertise in that area, but don't try to sway them, and then let them choose. Management shouldn't be present in the interviews of these advisors. I also recommend that a committee hire their legal advisor first for several reasons. One is that the lawyer can advise the uh, committee on the independence of the financial advisor, 
um, often the lawyers have worked with all the financial advisors and can recommend the ones that have more expertise and can assist the directors in asking questions during, during the meeting. Uh, in terms of determining independence, uh, you know, lawyers are, are well trained in identifying conflicts of interest. Independence goes beyond that. Uh, do, do the lawyers have any types of relationships with the sponsors that might make a court look askance at the alleged independence of the committee? And, and, and we take a very conservative view on that. For the financial advisors, we ask them and, uh, and uh, you know, other law firms ask financial advisors to fill out an independence questionnaire, sort of like a director's and officer's questionnaire. Sometimes we ask directors to do the same, to really smoke out any types of ownership of securities or other type of relationships that might um, call into question their independence. And again, a lot of this is about perception and about how a court or a plaintiff might react to these facts, even if it doesn't, in fact, compromise actual independence of the advisors. Uh, the role of the financial advisor, of course, is to deliver an opinion to the committee, not required by, by uh, anything, but a, um, a committee making a decision about a financial matter is almost always going to get a fairness opinion on a drop down. The partnership agreement speaks about uh, good faith. Good faith is a decision that the transaction is in the best interest of the partnership, not the unit holders. And so the opinion will speak to best interest of the partnership since the unit holders are not participants direct participants in the transaction. However, uh, directors also feel correctly that their obligations are really to the public unit holders. The resolutions will say they don't have to take into account the interests of the sponsor. And so often they will want the financial advisor opinion to speak um, about the fairness to the public unit holders. There's a mixed practice uh, about that. Meanwhile, the legal counsel to the committee uh, advises the committee members on their duties under the partnership agreement. Again, each partnership agreement may be slightly different. They do not typically draft the agreements, but they will review, comment on, and negotiate the agreements presented. They will perform the legal due diligence and advise the committee about their findings. Um, they can advise on, um, you know, on financial, um, on marketing. If there's, if there's needs to be a financing that goes along with the drop down. Uh, these types of lawyers are going to be familiar with the, that process and they can advise the committee on that. And they can talk to the committee about the litigation risk from the drop down. Best practice number four is deliberation. And this is one that, again, seems, uh, seems obvious, but in practice, uh, committee counsel and the financial advisors and the directors all need to uh, remind themselves of the, of the need for uh, uh, not to get hurried by a sponsor. Sponsors have uh, earnings calls by which they want to make an announcement of a drop down. Uh, they may have uh, credit agreement reasons to get the transaction done by a certain date. These are all legitimate goals, but they have to take a back seat to the committee doing its work and getting comfortable. Committees work hard um, <clears throat> and, and, they, and they certainly can be asked to spend a lot of hours in a short period of time, but they have to be comfortable. At the end of the day, they have to say to themselves, we're comfortable making this decision. A committee can rely very heavily on a fairness opinion from a banker. Uh, the partnership agreement explicitly says that as long as the committee reasonably believes that the financial advisor is competent in the area, which we obviously expect when they've gone through this process, and that they understand the basis for the opinion. But the uh, fairness opinion is not the whole picture. It, is, uh, it speaks only to the consideration of the transaction, the financial terms, and doesn't address things like strategy. Is this asset something 
that the MLP should be doubling down on at this time. That's an example. Uh, directors should meet on as many occasions as is necessary in person or by phone. Uh, ideally, it's nice to have a couple of meetings in person because that shows, uh, shows diligence, shows engagement on the part of the director. Sometimes that isn't feasible and uh, given how directors can be spread out and it may not be necessary, but it's something that committees ought to talk to their lawyers about. Best practice number five, ability to say no and negotiate. I happen to think the ability to say no is negotiation. Uh, sometimes a sponsor, not anymore so much, but, uh, but sometimes a sponsor will say we want an upper down vote on the proposal. We're not going to take any negotiations. Don't come back to us with a lower price. So that puts a committee in the situation where if they would otherwise negotiate, they'll have to say no and then it's up to the sponsor to come back with another price or not. If they come back with another price, really all that's happened is it's negotiation. But by forcing the committee into that position, it, it almost it puts the committee in a, in a bad position because it looks like they're um, being intimidated. So my advice to sponsors always is understand what type of negotiation this is Think about what you would do in a third party situation, probably not expecting a take it or leave it proposal, um, and understand what the duties of the committee are and why they need to negotiate. And, and, and so I think one of the uh, key points here is to get a sponsor to understand uh, the process, understand what a committee has to do, understand the litigation landscape, and how to make this process look better and be better uh, when, it's, when it's judged in hindsight. Um, David and AJ talked a little bit about how the court felt that there was a going through the motions. And so you can have a negotiation, but it, it can feel to the court like it's not a real one. Oh, the, the, um, you know, the sponsor left $10 million on the table and the committee took it and called it a day. That's you know, maybe that's a real negotiation, but maybe it's just an optical negotiation. So the committee can go back to the court and say, "Yeah, we, we negotiated this improvement in the price." So that 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 negotiation is helpful, but it may not be the whole story. And the other thing I would say is that a committee needs to think about whether this transaction is the right transaction at this moment, and I've been advising committees where they said, sounds like it might be a good deal, but not today. Not today because the asset's under development or because the capital markets aren't so good or because we have enough of that now and we want to see how it plays out. Committees do that, and, uh, and that's clearly the way a committee should function if they, they don't believe that the transaction at the time is in the best interest of the partnership. And, and a best practice number six, not related to the six reasons in the El Paso case, just that was to be six, is uh, record keeping. And if you think about it, when a court, a court's going to have several years down the road, is going to have several things to, to look at. One will be the testimony of the directors and the other participants, but memories are, um, are fleeting. And, but minutes, if these minutes are produced contemporaneously and they really explain the story, can be helpful. And so you want, you need to think about, well, what is it that the directors were concerned about and how did those issues get resolved to the director's satisfaction? That ought to be in the minutes. And so, and I haven't seen the, the minutes in El Paso, so I have no idea what's in them, but in, in that case, you would want them to say, well, we had our reservations about buying more LNG assets at this time, but we decided to do so for the following reasons. And if that's in those minutes, it would seem to me that would be a very helpful case. Um, and and, and they, as David's already mentioned, I think that you know, whatever you write is going to be discoverable in litigation. <clears throat> 
So what are the takeaways from all that, everything that everybody's talked about today? One is that El Paso is not new law. Everyone's very concerned that maybe it is. It's not new law. It is an application of the, the words of the partnership agreement, but it is an application in a way that hasn't been done before. Uh, other vice chancellors have looked at drop downs and concluded that they had to grant a motion to dismiss. And that didn't happen here. And I think that it does indicate that the courts are, uh, especially this vice chancellor, but you know, maybe others are very concerned about the MLP drop down process. And uh, there's, a, there's a signal here that everybody ought to step up their game, and work very hard to make sure that they're following the correct process. Talked a little bit about the next bullet point. But the, the focus has to be on what's in the MLP's best interest and combining that with the, the next bullet, accretion. You, if, if you were to say, yeah, this deal is great for the MLP, but it's not accretive, the market is going to react very negatively. The market expects accretion from these deals. It's, you know, in a way, the, one of the prime reasons why people do drop downs to make their investors happy with more cash flow per unit. But that's not the charge under the partnership agreement. Partnership agreement doesn't talk about accretion. It talks about the best interests of the partnership. And, uh, and so the focus needs to be on that. The, the court in El Paso that don't uh, unduly emphasize accretion, when the financial advisors in that deal and others present uh, their, they give their presentation to the, their directors, the vast bulk of their presentation relates to these traditional valuation analyses. And there's a page or two on accretion typically at the back. Where, where there might be undue uh, emphasis on it is not from the financial advisors, it's from directors because it's an easy thing to grasp onto. Everybody knows the market wants it. Everybody knows you have to have it. Um, and so the, I think the advice to directors is, yes, it's important. Pay very close attention to the other metrics in the financial advisor's presentation. Beware complacency. Um, Sponsor-controlled MLPs do lots of drop downs. Very easy to fall into the habit of uh, you know, whatever worked last time is going to work this time. Uh, clearly, you need to look at every deal afresh. There's in a, been an increasing use of um, a technique called opco drop downs, where instead of putting in 100% of a discrete asset, sponsors put in percentage interest of an asset, and then another drop down is more percentage interest of same. That's what happened in the El Paso case. And in that situation, it makes it easier for a plaintiff or a court to look back at the previous drop down and, why, and to ask questions, why is something different here? Why did you pay the same price or more price or, or a higher price? Or why, why were these terms different? Even if there are very good reasons for it, uh, it these inconsistencies are just fodder for a plaintiff's case, so they require more attention. Another thing that the court in the El Paso case cited were some communications between the financial advisor and management, either before the conflicts committee had had a discussion or uh, otherwise. Uh, and I, you know, to me, it's not necessarily anything nefarious there. It's simply a sponsor saying, we're going to do another drop down. Here are the projections. We'll get you up to speed. But I do think that uh, it, is, it is a better procedure to, to have the initial contact from the sponsor be to the committee. The committee may, after all, want to use a different financial advisor in this situation. And uh, they need to be the ones who make the decisions about that. The committee needs to understand the Fairness opinion, 
and we've talked about that. And then, of course, be careful using email. Uh, I don't think email should be used by directors except for ministerial tasks like, can we have a call at 3 p.m. on Friday? Um, it, it's simply a, a way to get in trouble. A director has a thousand thoughts, and email captures 10 of them. And those 10 thoughts may be the 10 negative ones, but the subsequent, uh, the subsequent cogitation by the director, oh, yeah, I got comfortable with this point. That's not an email. And if the director has trouble remembering that point four years later, then it's that email that's really going to stand out there. And that, uh, that concludes our presentation. We do have a few minutes for questions. We've gotten any by email, or if anybody in the room has questions, we're happy to take them. Yes, Dan. Um, the question relates to the uh, to the Texas statutes and their interpretation of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, and and, uh, and whether any MLP partnership agreements are governed by Texas law. Um, I'll answer that latter one. I can think of one operating partnership agreement done like 20 years ago that was governed by Texas law, but it's highly unusual. And David, I'll, if you could talk about those points, well. I think the, that, at least in Delaware, the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, it's something you can't disclaim, like fiduciary duties, but as a practical matter, it's really not that big a deal because it really is just applicable as a gap filler to, to represent a situation or to apply to a situation where the parties haven't thought of something. And the MLP arena now has been so flooded with issues and, and whatnot it's a pretty rare concept that hasn't been addressed. And so the partnership agreements really kind of come up with, you know, almost every conceivable situation. So the, the instances in which that, that the implied covenant that has actually come into, deal, you know, come into operation from the court's perspective, they're pretty few and far between. Well, we'll see. Um, now that the El, now that El Paso two came down this morning, El Paso one can now go up on appeal. Everything was held kind of in limbo while the standing question was was addressed. So this will all now go up to the Delaware Supreme Court. Again, from a legal perspective, the standing question is is the real interesting legal one. El Paso one is really all about the the unusual facts and the unusual results. So the El Paso decision wasn't one about the implied covenant, and uh, Vice Chancellor Laster has written about about that implied covenant and, and said what you don't want to do is have that become a way to um, uh, shoehorn other types of provisions into it. We have to guard against that, and so far I mean, there have been a case or so that has found a violation of it. But that, that hasn't been the worry. The worry is that, well, I don't it's even worry because I think that people can take actions, but the concern is that the, that the courts, as these partnership agreements have gotten liberalized and the standard of conduct has, frankly, diminished um, from best interest to, uh, and El Paso was best interest, but some of them now are simply, a director only has to find that a transaction isn't adverse to to the partnership that the, the courts are going to be more concerned are the uh, are the unit holders protected and so they may be taking a, a little bit of a harder look at some of these cases. To be clear, we and others have had any number of cases in which unit holders or shareholders have argued that leave, leaving aside the contractual obligations and whatnot, the defendants breached the implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing and they've used that to try to shoehorn in fiduciary duties and, and all tort concepts and whatnot. And the courts have been very, very resistant to that. I mean, they've actually said you have to be specifically complaining about some loophole or gap in the partnership agreement or else it's not going to apply. Any other questions? Yes. 
the question was, what do we see as the key distinction between a finding by a fairness advisor of fairness to the partnership as opposed to fairness to the public unit holders? Without without focusing on accretion dilution. So the, the partnership agreement standard, for better or worse, says that a director's duty is to look out after the best interests of the partnership. An independent director feels that we're looking out after the, uh, the interests of the partnership, but the sponsor can take care of itself. And when you remove the sponsor from the equation of the partnership, you're left with the other equity owners who are the public unit holders. And so they are looking at, they feel that that's really who they're looking out for. In a merger context in which the unit holders are getting consideration, I don't think there's any question that the opinion is going to go to fairness to the unit holders. Not, and the partnership agreement doesn't say fairness to unit holders, but practitioners interpret it in that context. It can only mean fairness to the unit holders in a merger. In a drop down, um, really what it is, it's the partnership engaging in a transaction. If it's fair to the partnership, you know, are there situations where the sponsor's interest in it skew that analysis? So somehow it could be fair to the partnership and not the public unit holders. Probably difficult to come up with that situation. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. But. Yeah, well, from a litigation perspective, there is an argument that if, and this is the issue we have going on right now in the appeal of the Kinder Morgan roll-up. We represent the complex committee of Kinder Morgan. Um, this same court, uh, in Delaware dismissed a challenge to that roll-up. It's on up an appeal now, and the, arg the only argument on appeal that, that the unit holders are making is that in that case, the, the opinion was directed not only as being in the best interest of the MLP, but also being in the best interest of the unaffiliated unit holders. And the argument on appeal is that by voluntarily you know, taking the position and a public uh, position that the transaction was in the best interest of the unaffiliated unit holders. The plaintiff is arguing that by doing so, we in effect adopted uh, the obligation to ensure that in fact the transaction was in the best interest of the unaffiliated unit holders in almost like an entire fairness type environment. We think it's a pretty ridiculous argument, but nonetheless, it's out there and, and until the Delaware Supreme Court rules in our case, it's not 100% settled. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you everyone for participating. We'll be having another um, corporate series in January. I believe it'll be the second week, Tuesday or Wednesday, and it'll be on uh, MDNA, so hope you can join us. Thank you.